I'm Bruce, and tonight um, I'd just like to thank Jess for um, inviting me to speak to you all. Um, and Jess sort of left it up to me to decide what I wanted to talk about. Um, and I'm in three weeks' time headed to southwest Colombia, so for me this is a really good revision um, of what uh, I saw in, on previous trips. Um, so I'm really excited to think that I'll be back um, having fun in the bush. Um, I've done uh, three trips to this region over time. Um, the first one was in 2008 um, and we were looking for a heliconia uh, and then back in 2017 and then we crossed the border into um, Let's see if, yeah, here we go. Um, we cross the border into Colombia. Alrighty, so this is the border um, of Ecuador and Colombia. And basically, there are only two roads um, in this region. This particular road um, was, I think, built in the 70s. And before that, there was a railway that ran down um, from um, Ibarra down to the coast. So that, that road's been there for quite a while. And then in um, Nariño, in southern Colombia, this particular road has been there. Uh, that probably would have been a mule trail originally. Um, and that road uh, has been there for a long time. Um, certainly there are plants that were described along that road back in the 1800s. Um, and then there was more stuff described in the 40s. So it's a very um, old road, but um, this particular region was quite dangerous for a long time. Uh, I know um, a bromeliad friend, Geoffrey Kent, is the only person that I know that, that had been there, and he visited this area in the early 80s. Um, and virtually since then, it's been pretty much um, off limits. The nature reserves that are along this road were closed for six and eight years um, when there was internal troubles. Um, but since then, um, it's opened back up and um, it's not too bad. Um, the other thing I guess we should say is this is the, um, uh, the Andes. And at this stage in southern Colombia, it's still a single range. Uh, it hasn't split into the three different ranges, which, um, which is something that sets Colombia apart, you know, just with the diversity. Um, this is also the Inter-American Highway, and that's the main um, route for, for um, transport and, um, and goods. All righty. All right, so this is the, hel the Heliconia that we were visiting the area to look for um, in 2009, 2009 I think it was. Um, we didn't find it. This is Heliconia lutheri. Uh, some of you might know Anthurium lutheri um, from the same region. Um, Harry Luther was a um, bromeliad expert um, and taxonomist at the Mary Selby Botanical Gardens in Florida. Um, and Harry had a, a massive um, bushy beard, red-brown coloured, and so this plant was named for him um, because of uh, Harry's beard. So we found it um, in 2017. All righty. Um, it's a very mountainous area, um, and you can see um, this area's been cleared, this is being developed, as, as they say, so that certainly um, over time, um, along, here we are on the, on the Ecuadorian side of the border. Um, it's, it's, the forest is coming down and, and people that were there in the 80s uh, discovering bromeliads and such, um, as they've gone back, they've said that, well, there's no forest left anymore. But along that road, it's basically you've got to get up into the mountains to find forest. Uh, this is another road that we came across in 2017. This is uh, a road that runs north um, from, the, from the main road. Um, this new road is headed towards the um, Awa Indian Reserve um, and the Colombian border. And you can see, uh, basically, they're there to, to cut the forest down and take the timber. Uh, once that's 
gone, they'll then set fire to what's left um, and graze beef cattle. Uh, it's not what you would call good pasture, but that's the only way that they can make, it, make money. So, so basically that's, that's what's happening. It's very sad um, and, you know, huge areas of, of forest and plants disappear quickly. Um, generally, they'll leave some of the palms um, because they can be used for building and you'll see philodendrons and anthuriums um, clinging to these palms out in cattle pasture. Um, so it's pretty depressing. But there are still good plants along the road. So, um, so this is along that road. This is philodendron magnum. So it's a very large, more than a metre across. Um, to my mind, it's even bigger than philodendron gigas um, when it's in full maturity. This is uh, Anthurium longiintinodum. Um, it's in a section xylophyllum. And I'll probably show you quite a few. You'll all be experts on section xylophyllum tonight because I've got a few within this group. Generally, they've got a scandent or, or sort of rambling habit. And generally, the internodes are, are longer, um, you know, big spaces. So they've got stemmed growth habit. And here it is um, popping an inflorescence. And um, just a close up there. The next one, this is Anthurium turdi collectivum. Um, this plant um, is in Australia. Um, there's a beautiful specimen up in the Flecker Botanical Gardens. Um, it was mixed up with Ovatifolium originally, but um, turdi collectivum has a very thin um, spadix and produces white seed that extrude, pop out from, from this, um, this infructescence. Uh, and it also has a coalescent growth habit, so it tends to um, have sort of 150 to 200 mils between nodes on the, on the stem, so it's quite a, a, a climbing sort of plant. But it is in um, section Digitinervium, um, which Ovatifolium is part of that group as well. But beautiful oval-shaped leaves, very attractive plant. Uh, we came across this philodendron. Um, to, my, to my knowledge, it's undescribed. Um, generally, I'll send photos to David Sherbridge, um, and he's very happy to give me IDs on things that he knows. Um, previously, we've also been sending photos to Tom Crote. Um, Carla Black, who I travel with, um, has a good relationship with Tom. Um, Tom spent a lot of time in Panama as, as uh, early in his career and so um, he and Carla have got a lot of um, shared, uh, uh, you know, sort of um, with the locality and, and um, Tom loves going back to Panama and, and visiting so um, he's always interested to see photos of where we've been just to, to get an idea of what, what's out, you know, in particular areas. Um, but this one, yeah, I don't think it's got a name as yet. Um, this is Anthurium McPhersoni. Um, it's another species that we've seen further north in Colombia, but it's got this beautiful sort of long, thin, textured leaf, uh, and you can see the uh, inflorescence there. Okay. Alrighty. Um, so once we're off that main road that runs down to the coast, um, there is minor roads that head up into the mountains that make up the border. Um, and this is the road from Carolina up to El Chical. And El Chical is a tiny little town right on the border. Um, and it's an area where um, a lot of new discoveries are being made. A lot of plants are being described from this area. And as, as botanists move north um, and into this area, you can see... Um, it's, it's a gravel road, it's pretty rough um, and pretty amazing sort of mountains uh, along the way. And so heading up, gaining a bit of altitude, um, we come across Anthurium protrudens. Um, these beautiful textured leaves and in the, in the, 
on the same tree is philodendron planodents growing. Um, but you can see this big um, chunky infructescence um, of protrudens. It's a, it's a really pretty plant. Probably getting uh, above 2,000 metres here, so it's, it's getting you know, up the hill. This is uh, Anthurium esmeraldens. Um, so very common through this whole area. The, the state um, further down the hill in, in Ecuador is called Esmeraldas, so it's named for, for this particular region. And no matter where I go, I seem to find Monsteras, um, but they all kind of look the same to me. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I send photos to David and he just says Monstera species. So, we, you know, really um, you would need someone to have a good close look at the inflorescence and have an idea of what they're looking at. You've got to remember that really, um, you know, when, the, when, it, when it all comes down to it, I'm a heliconia kind of guy and, and aeroids are just things that I see uh, along the way. But I'm taking more of an interest um, as, I, as I travel. Uh, this is Anthurium longicordatum, uh, and this is um, section polynurium, and it's related to um, Anthurium cuspidatum. So there's a, a rather large group of related plants. Um, Tom Crote published a, uh, a paper that, that has split quite a few species out of cuspidatum um, and I think it's called a revision of the cuspidatum complex. Um, so um, this particular one um, is notable in that it's a little bit smaller um, and it's got a very pointed leaf apex whereas cuspidatum is more uh, uh, obtuse or rounder sort of leaf tip. Um, it's native to Nariño and northwest Ecuador, whereas cuspidatum grows over a huge range. Uh, I've seen it growing in Panama, Costa Rica, Ecuador. Yeah, I think it grows down into Bolivia. So it's quite a widespread species. This one is from this region. Um, along the road up, up to El Chical, this is Philodendron planodens. Um, this particular individual has got a bit of a growth defect in that uh, all those left top lobes are deformed, so uh, I don't know what would cause that and continue for that. Um, so it would be, I guess, an aberrant form. And along the way, um, you do see a bit of Anthurium andrianum. So generally epiphytic. Um, the, one, the only ones that I've seen on the ground are obviously ones that have fallen out of a tree. Um, and the ones in the bush are all this sort of orangey red. Um, so there's no white ones, pink ones. <laughs> They've all come from Europe. Hey, Bruce, yep. Do you laugh when you see a plant like that that's so common in cultivation in the wild? Uh, I, to me, it, it's exciting to see it, um, you know, because there's a huge industry that, that's sprung up, you know, from this species. Um, I remember going to a, 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 an anthurium grower um, in Hawaii and they had 32 acres of anthuriums, cut flowers. And um, basically it was lava rock and um, they hilled it up into rows um, and they had a, a shade cloth cover and the plants were planted directly into the lava rock, handful of osmocote, and nature took its course. Um, they had enough rain, regular rain, that they could produce cut flowers until they, the um, anthurium bacteria came through and nearly wiped them out. So anyway, different story. Um, and this particular plant was one that I, I saw all through northwestern Ecuador, and uh, I was very excited thinking, oh, it, it could be um, Draconopterum, but it, this thing's much larger than Draconopterum. Um, leaves are probably 1.2 metres long. Um, 
It's, there's something that has been described across in the Colombian side called Melampii, which I'll show you later. This thing is still undescribed, um, but it is known from collections. Um, um, Madison and Bess have, have collected it, um, and it will get a name one day, but, it, but this um, hooded spathe and, and weeping um, spadix generally pink or purple um, is its distinguishing sort of feature for this undescribed species. It's sin section Bellolontium, um, and that, that habit, um, you know, fits, fits quite well within that. Um, but uh, this was probably uh, at about 2,000 metres, so it, it, um, it wouldn't be happy in, with any sort of heat. Um, Another monsterio, less, less fenestrations. Well, I'll show you a few. <laughs> uh, this is Anthurium banalii. So once again, we're at, we're at um, probably 1,800 or more. So this, this particular species has um, beautiful um, textured bullate leaves. Um, a very fine undulation, bubbly sort of texture, um, but um, once again, probably wouldn't be happy if the temperature got above 26, 28 degrees. Uh, this is a philodendron that I took a photo of an in inflorescence, but neglected to take a photo of the leaf. <laughs> I promise to do better next time. All right, so here we are at the town of El Chical. Um, so it's right on the border with Colombia, and there's a little river that flows that separates the two countries. And we stopped for lunch, and we were drinking Colombian beer. And we thought, how is it that we can be in the middle of nowhere in Ecuador on the border, and there's no bridges, but we're drinking Colombian beer? And so we thought, there must be roads that come down or some way that they can transport goods to this little village out in the middle of nowhere. So we sort of started thinking, well, you know, I wonder what's on this side of the river. So that was the sort of um, our thinking that made us eventually get to southwestern Colombia. Um, so the local council or whatever um, put up signs. So this is uh, the tourist path of, of biodiversity um, and mentioned is um, Bosque Protector is, is like a nature reserve and Cerro Golandrinus is um, the mountain of the swallows and it's a very high um, peak and, and protected area uh, and there's a lot of new orchids. Um, we found a new heliconia on that road and um, there's certainly new bromeliads up there. And then they also mention um, orchids, um, you know, further that way, which was west towards the uh, Awa Indian Reserve. So they're trying to encourage people to go and look at nature, which is a good thing. Alrighty. Um, so here we are in Colombia um, on the Inter-American Highway at about 1,800 metres at a town called Pedregal. And this is where the road to Tamaco, which is on the coast, so this is the, the second road that I showed. This is the road that goes from um, Pasto down to um, Tamaco in Nariño. And this is at 1,800 metres. It's very dry. You can see um, agaves, talansias, pitcanias, um, opuntias. And amongst them are um, pachynurium anthuriums growing an all-day full sun. So um, there are some species that are incredibly tough. Um, but unfortunately, most pachynuriums look the same. So it's hard to tell what you're looking at. And this is the road um, heading along. So we start at 1,800 metres, and I think the best way to describe this road is you actually drive between the volcanoes down. But before you go down, you've got to go up. So we ended up going up to about 3,000 metres, and this is the view, 
and then then we started the long drive down and into the wet forest now this whole area once you're on that Pacific Slope is, is known as the Choco biogeographical region. So it's one of the wettest areas in the world and it's also wet all year round. So generally these areas have two wet seasons or they only have six weeks where it's dry-ish but it'll still rain in the dry season. So uh, it's a very wet forest which is ideal for aeroids and certainly Fantastic for Heliconia. So I mentioned uh, volcanoes. This is, uh, what's this one? Um, it'll come to me, El Cumbal. So um, this is one of the volcanoes that you drive between. This is at dawn. So um, normally you wouldn't see it for cloud cover, but you can see it's venting some steam. And just looking at it, it looks as if the top's blown off at some stage. Uh, a lot of the volcanoes, th I think this thing is at least more than four and a half thousand metres tall, so it's quite a tall mountain, but um, still quite active and um, certainly there's very active volcanoes in Ecuador. This is the best map that I found of the region and uh, it was hanging um, in a reserve, but basically um, this is the road that little squiggly line um, that goes to the coast. So that's the main road. Um, this is La Planada Reserve, which is the, the first reserve that we stopped at. That right down there is El Chical in Ecuador, if you can see. So um, we were there having lunch, looking across. Um, and when I go uh, in a couple of weeks' time, uh, we'll be staying in Altaquer here and we'll be using local guides to take us on motorbikes um, or something, mules maybe. Uh, because apparently these areas aren't, uh, aren't roads, but they're more tracks and paths and things. But somehow the beer truck got there. I don't, I'm, I'm intrigued to know and I'm determined to find out. So... All right, so this is La Planada, so uh, it's 3,300 hectares, 4.6 metres of rain a year, so that's probably four times what we get in Brisbane. Um, and average sort of height there is about 1,800, so it's quite high. Um, and the 19 degrees, I can tell you, after a day stomping around the forest, you wanted to, there was cold showers, so it was, it was nasty. But... Um, you, you didn't wait, yeah, yeah. you as, tried to jump in the shower as quickly as you could while you're still warm. And this is the view from La Planada and uh, these are some of the mountains along the border and um, as you can see they're incredibly steep. And this is the view, La Planada means the plain in Spanish, so it's a very flat area. Um, but it's got these interesting um, old volcanic plugs. So um, in, in time gone by, that would have all been very active um, volcano or volcanic area. Uh, La Planada has a very sort of low forest cover. Um, there's not anything in the way of huge massive trees, um, but everything's covered in um, moss um, because of the moisture. This is uh, Anthurium um, carchiensis, and really this is the only pachyneurum that you see in this, in this region. Um, it's a very thin leaf one, but um, it's the only pachyneurum that I came across in, in my travels. Uh, this is Phil Philodendron orantospadix, um, which has the orange staminate portion of the inflorescence. So you can see these orange sort of spathes. Philodendron planodents. Now the good thing with this area is Tom Crote went and, and described a heap of new species when he visited La Planada. And you can download his um, paper from the International Aeroid Society for free. 
So it, for me, it was really handy having um, a, a published um, guide to the area, really. We could sort of take photos or look at stuff in the bush, come back that night, look on the laptop and know what we were looking at. And that's um, Planet Ents again. This is um, Philodendron Nerino Ents, native to this part of Nerino. And beautiful um, foliage. And really quite striking inflorescence as well. Um, Anthurium longicordatum again. And you can see that um, inflorescence is very reminiscent of, of um, uh, Anthurium cuspidatum. Now this is Anthurium melampii, so it's in Bellolontium again. It's closely re related to that thing that I showed you with the hooded um, spadix, spathe. So it's a big, massive plant, well over a metre, those leaves, very attractive. And you can see, um, you know, that hooded spathe and, and the pendant spadix. And growing right next to it, this plant here, if we're, yep. This is um, Anthurium pendulous spadix. So this particular plant, that spadix can be 33 centimetres long. So it's quite an interesting uh, inflow. And that's another one. It, it gets white berries as well, um, which is Something that I don't see regularly in the bush is white, white anthurium fruit. Usually they're purple, orange, you know, something that's going to attract the birds to, to spread them. So just interesting. And of course, philodendron varicosum grows everywhere. Um, I went through a stage where I stopped photographing them. Um, and then everyone's saying, no, take photos, take photos. But... Alrighty, so this is Anthurium ovatifolium um, and also a little Andrianum growing. So that gives you an idea of the size of this, this plant. Um, Anthurium ovatifolium tends to get a very, almost like a club shaped infructescence when it's mature. And instead of the white berries that we saw on Turdy Collectivum, the, these guys get exerted red fruit. So it's, it's quite different. Um, this thing doesn't tend to be coalescent at all. It'll, it'll grow from a crown, or almost like a pachyneurum. So just, um, just to highlight the, the difference between the species. And this is the local Andrianum. Um, and you can see this one's setting a whole lot of seed. And they tend to have this sort of bicolored um, spadix. Um, so this is as, as, as they are in the bush. Uh, this is Anthurium esmeraldense again, with that sort of quilted leaf, um, often purplish under, un, underneath, and that's the um, inflorescence there. So it's a very ornamental looking plant. Um, protrudens again with that really sort of textured big leaves, more than a metre, so it's very, very ornamental. Uh, Stenospermations, they're a whole whew, thing on their own. Uh, I think in, in Tom's paper for La Planada, there were probably five or six, and only two of them had been described. The others were, were yet to be named. And of course, when you're in the forest, there's all sorts of other plants. This is uh, Cavendishia in the Ericaceae, so related to blueberries. Passion fruit. Uh, this one was growing out of a huge liane, like a, a woody stem, probably um, six inches thick, 150 mil, um, and putting out these coliferous flowers. So very, um, very different passion fruit to what, to what we're used to. This is Philodendron um, Veruca, pe petiol, Veruca petiolum. Uh, quite variable. So this was sort of like an ovate shape, 
This was a very rounded one. Uh, and interesting stem. Uh, this is Philodendron fibrosum, um, quite different in leaf shape to what we'd seen further in western Ecuador. These, these um, quite round leaves with, with less texture, but it still had the really um, interesting petioles. And you can see they're really, um, those appendages are, are incredible and even on the um, inflorescence. Uh, this is Anthurium microspatics. Now, microspatics occurs from Mexico right through to Bolivia, so incredibly widespread species. Um, it's, um, it's one of these species that just um, rambles over the sort of um, under, undergrowth and um, covers. This is Anthurium terracolum, and terracolum uh, means that it, it grows or it loves growing in the ground, so it's a terrestrial habit. Uh, it's in that um, xylof xylophilium group section. Um, where its internodes are quite long. It's a cute little plant. And this is Anthurium mindense, which is another species that occurs over a fair range. It's in the same section, Xylophilium. One day I'll get it, uh, I'll, I'll learn how to pronounce it. But it's got that really um, scandent spreading habit. And... Um, Bright, bright red fruit when it's mature. Uh, this is Anthurium banalii again, just a different, slightly different leaf shape, but that really rugose textured uh, leaf surface. And another one, slightly more immature leaf there. This is um, Anthurium membranaceum. So, um, Probably about a metre long leaves, quite textured um, with a white inflorescence. And this is Anthurium pulvernulentum. Um, and I think this thing has these lovely, beautiful green um, inflorescences. And you can see they're just popping out white seed or just thinking about popping out white seed there. And of course... Um, Chlorospathas is something that um, I probably would have walked over or walked past, but with Tom's um, uh, paper, with all the photos and descriptions, you can certainly get an idea or an appreciation of, of what you're looking at. So that really helps for someone um, who, who isn't, or ha isn't, yeah, isn't into Chlorospathas. Another Monstera. Now this is pretty typical of the actual road. So this is out, uh, out of the nature reserve and, and on the road to Tamako. And um, we'd, we'd stopped for this heliconia, which turned out to be new. Um, but this gentleman was heading off into his farm, which was up in, in here. Um, and then I was looking at the photo and realised that this is Philodendron esmeraldense here. And this is, uh, I think, Anthurium delicious stachium. And, yeah, so I think that's good for Delichostachium. But uh, at the time, we were excited about that, so we didn't, didn't really even look to, to confirm the identity. But I think we found um, two new species on, on this particular trip of Heliconia. This is Philodendron esmeraldense, growing um, next to the beer sign in Ricarte, so um, beautiful big leaves, very attractive plant, that's for sure. And of course there's orchids, one for you Barry, that's all right, I think it's a little maxillaria, you can see this little guy trying to get out, yeah. 
And our guides took us to this uh, lady's property and she's growing the local uh, andrianums um, for cut flowers. And so I think it was once a fortnight a truck would come and take the cut flowers up to the, to the main city, Pasto, which is the capital of the province. And um, she was just growing in the ground um, and obviously she had a lot of bacterial and fungal problems because of um, you know how she was trying to cultivate them, so um, we gave him some tips on trying to you know get them up out of the dirt and and into you know some sort of a growing media that would drain freely. And this is the other crop that we uh, see a bit of. This is coca growing. Um, we were trying to get into the forest fragments around to look for plants, and we drove straight into this this farm. Um, it's generally not a problem, the people growing the cocoa, it's the people uh, um, turning it into cocaine that you've got to stay away from. Generally they're down the hill um, below 700 metres, um, which is where this stuff grows better. But this was um, up the hill around about 1100 metres and we were really surprised to see it growing at that altitude. But um, it's uh, a crop that they can make a good living from um, and it's sort of, they can, you know, um, it's easier to transport than, than bananas or sugar cane or anything like that. They can send it off to be processed, so um, it is what it is. This is um, next stop in terms of reserves. This is the Rio Nambi. This is at about 1,100 to 1,600 metres. Here they get seven metres of rain a year. Um, this is a private um, reserve that was set up probably about 20 years ago by a young guy and um, the, its its main um, thing is, bird, is for birders to go there um, and their dry season is July, August and the rest of the time it's wet. Uh, and the good thing about staying there is you can stay at Christian's house. Um, Christian is the guy that set it up um, but his mum lives in town and we were able to stay. So after a, oh, after a hard day in the forest, generally we sit down with a beer and the laptop and transfer photos and trying to get a handle on what we've seen, relax. But the good thing about um, Christian's mum's house is it's the general store as well. So there's the beer fridge and um, you could get bananas, corn, whatever you needed. It's very handy. Uh -huh. Vericosum grows there, as you can see. And because of that seven metres of rain, uh, you can see everything's coated in uh, epiphytes. Um, and this is um, me in my happy place. Uh, and the only, the only downside is, ooh, is uh, for the birders, they don't like getting wet, so they cut all this timber and lay it as a path but it just ends up being so slippery and dangerous but um, anyway uh, I usually end up getting pretty muddy in the forest so it's, it's just added adventure. We came across this philodendron which uh, David Sherbridge has, has seen down in uh, Kachi which is on the other side in Ecuador and it's got this, um, it's yet to be described but it's got this beautiful pediole pattern and um, that photo hopefully will allow him, you know, to uh, one day that they'll be able to describe it. No doubt when they find it. More orchids. Uh, and this reserve was full of different chlorospathas, so very interesting um, foliage. To me, they, they, they remind me of, of um, caladiums in, in terms of growth, habit and size, um, obviously just lacking the colours, but um, interesting foliage and when they do flower, um, there's quite an interesting um, inflorescence. Uh, this is philodendron, I have to go back to my notes. Ruga pediolatum. So this one has the textured leaf, but it also has a really brown, rugose, textured, warty sort of petiole. So um, quite, 
quite a, a pretty thing. We saw that in, in Western Ecuador as well, so it's quite a, a widespread species. And Anthurium draconoptrum, which is a cute little thing. Um, generally, the leaves are only about 30 or 40 centimetres long, so it's, it's quite a small plant. Um, but um, really attractive uh, leaf shape. Uh, Diffenbachias. This one was actually growing up the side of a tree, which I thought was a bit odd. Um, Xanthosomas. This one had an interesting um, sort of um, margin. Um, Unfortunately, my um, botanical knowledge or uh, descriptors aren't, aren't that good. Uh, this is Anthurium rivular, and um, it's quite a common species. Generally, it grows very close to water or in the water. And you can see um, this one's virtually growing as far as it can, or as close as it can, without being swept away by the creek. Another stenospermation with a very rounded leaf. And the last reserve that we went to is La Nutria, and this is run by the local indigenous Awa people. Um, and La Nutria is their word for the, the otter. So um, this particular area is down near Hunin, uh, so we're down uh, lower, probably 700 to 800 metres elevation. And the thing that struck me about this sort of area was that it was very flat until you went to an edge of a cliff and then it went straight down. And um, so uh, there was a lot of air movement, a lot of wind, um, but it was still very wet. And, and because we're getting down the hill, it was getting hotter and more humid. Um, this is Philod um, Philodendron hebitatum. Quite a variable sort of leaf shape. Um, and inflorescence there. Uh, this is Philodendron linhanninii. And as m some of you would know, it's quite, quite sought after. It's quite a beautiful... Um, foliage. This was growing in a very wet, wet area, so it would, would not be happy if it dried out at all. So it's the sort of thing that, um, that would need to be in, in a modified environment, I think, or growing, you know, very wet. But you can see those, those beautiful leaves. It's an interesting sort of scaling on the petiole. And it's just the underside to the leaf and inflorescence in bud. Uh, different backiers of different shapes. And of course, this is primary forest, so there's a lot of um, bromeliads still in the trees. Um, generally, bromeliad people are always looking for primary forest, big trees where the plants can... can occur generally when the forest comes down you, you just don't see a lot of species. This is an interesting Pitcania which had this beautiful pink hanging inflorescence um, new to science I guess the bromeliad botanists weren't there in May when we were. Uh, Anthurium and Chicaeans which is uh, a little low growing thing um, Reminded me of um, Anthurium lancifolium from Panama. And I think this is likely to be Philodendron squamicol, um, but quite different to the ones that I've seen in Panama and, and, other, and, and northern Colombia, but um, certainly got the, the fuzzy um, spades. And... Um, it's interesting, people online can tell you that, that you can tell serpents and squamicol by the fuzz here and there, and, but it really it all comes down to what's, what's happening on, that, um, on those spathes. 
Um, the painting of serpents is a glabrous spathe, so, which was done in like 1860 or something. So, But um, beautiful philodendron. And then we took the road further down um, into towards the town of Barbacoas. So Barbacoas is down in the lowlands. Um, and here we are at about a thousand meters um, heading downhill. And you can see the road, the, the greenery takes up, you know, at least a third of the road. Um, this is just hillsides covered in picanias and calatheas and things. And didn't really see a lot of anthuriums um, or phyllos down at this elevation. It's funny, um, generally the anthuriums are sort of at about 2,000 to, to say 1,000, then philodendrons are a little bit lower, and then below that are the Diffenbachias, so sort of interesting range in them. And of course, something different, a new Calathea, which was cute. And um, came across this trilobed anthurium, which may or may not be Fercatum. Um, Fercatum is really known from Ecuador, but it's not that far as the crow flies. And we came to the golden toad, and it was time to turn around. So, so that's all the photos that I've got for you. If, um, if you've got any questions, please let me know. Probably stunned you all into silence for a boy. <laughs> yep. Uh, depends on the elevation. So um, at, say, 1800 metres at La Planada, their, their average temperature is 19 degrees. So the lower you go, the warmer it gets. Um, I think. Eric would be able to tell you <laughs> uh, there is a there is a you know a, a, a differential of ele elevation and temperature, but generally once once you start getting below 700 meters, it starts getting nasty, like above 30 degrees and hu and humid and 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 unpleasant. I kind of like to stay between 700 and 1500 um, in terms of Plants in that range tend to have the ability to have some cold tolerance and some heat tolerance. The higher you go, the plants have got no adaption for heat. So often um, a plant from further up the hill, if you have it in cultivation here in southeast Queensland, in say September, October, when we have one of those high 30 degree days, you know, they'll generally give up the ghost, they'll be very unhappy. Yep. I couldn't tell you, Stan. <laughs> you can eat anything, but it's just how it tastes. So, yeah, um, no. I find when I'm in the bush, I never see fruit on philodendron or monsteras. Um, anthuriums, I think because they're a visual thing um, with the bright colours, you, you, your eye is attracted to them. Whereas a philodendron is generally just a gelatinous ma mass of cream. I've seen an orange one in Panama, but generally I, I just don't see them. So, yeah. Do you think local botanists in the areas where you often travel, do they request herbarium specimens or anything? Or uh, yeah, just on the herbarium specimens, no. We... we we're enthusiasts, so we're not botanists. So um, what I do is, is take as many photos as I can um, and then I share them with botanists. Um, so um, actually, Eric, that's wonderful. I, I just remembered. <coughs> Reference. So um, if you're looking for, for great images of aeroids, go to David's um, aeroidpictures.fr. Um, I think I've got 
70 species of anthurium and 50 species of philodendron there that, that I've, I've been able to share and, and obviously um, David's website shares um, throughout the world. So anyone, you know, if you've got a photo of something that, that you don't think is on there, talk to David and, and get it up there because trying to encourage people um, to, to take, you know, more of an interest and, and to see um, such a range of species and images is wonderful. The other thing uh, I would um, like to mention is, is Tom Crote shares the bulk of his published papers um, on aeroids as well. And you can get to them at aeroid.org. And um, for someone like me um, to be able to download that sort of stuff and take it along on my laptop, it just makes it so much easier trying to work out what we're looking at. Um, unfortunately, I can't read uh, or understand a lot of botanical terms because I'm not a botanist, um, but I'm really good with photos. So if they've got photos in the publications, that makes it a lot easier. Um, this is an example. This is just on my laptop. These are the two um, papers that, that Tom published um, when he visited La Planada. So, um, you know, that's just fantastic. Um, I think he described something like 28 new species of anthurium or something you know, in that range when he visited. So, um, you know, as we get told, there's a, th a thousand described species and there's likely to be another 2,000 still out there that don't have names. So, um, it often is difficult to know what you're actually looking at because likely it, it may not be described. So. Alrighty, well thanks very much.